Yeah, give the Lord a hand clap, amen. Give God a hand clap because he deserves it, amen. Not because I ask, not because I say, but because he alone deserves it. And I don't know how you came in tonight, but I know that, you know what, this month has been set apart just for you. Did you know that? Did you know that this isn't just another event on calendar? This isn't just another theme? I was sharing with my husband today and I thought about something that I had heard on television, on TVN, it was this rabbi. And they were talking about, you know, the Jewish calendar and they were talking about certain dates, you know, when you think about Esther and you think about uh, Purim and you think of just different events, you know, and, and I can't help but to think what he was talking about because they're not just dates, they're not just another event, but there's something special. And this November fall fire, this is something special. And if you're not here, you're going to miss out. Not because we're saying you're going to miss out, because God has a word for you. You don't know that in these settings, there's going to be a transformation that takes place. Something begins to shift. Something begins to happen. Yes, God could do it at home, but it doesn't always happen like that. Some of us don't have that discipline to be able to do that. And when we come here, we ignite each other, right? We ignite each other. We get ex each other fired up. We get refocused. We get realigned, realigned, amen. And right now, we're just going to, I'm going to go ahead and open up. I prayed already, and I just want to thank God for my salvation. You can turn with, thank you, worship. Didn't they do an awesome job? They just learned that because God had really, I just wanted that song so bad. I heard it there in Europe, and it just touched my life over there. But if you could turn with me to Matthew 21, 21. And I just want to thank God for my salvation. I never take it lightly, being called and saved by Jesus over 22, I think 22 or maybe 23 years ago. And I'm forever grateful, and I thank God for my husband for giving me the privilege and opportunity tonight to be able to speak and share the word of God with you. I don't, I do not take this lightly. And if you can read with me, I'm going to go ahead and begin. It says, then Jesus told them, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. You can pray for anything. And if you have faith, you will receive it. And before you sit down, I want you to tell the person next to you, can you see it? And you can have your seat. The title of my message is, can you see what I see? Do you believe it? And are you ready to receive it? Amen. See, we here, here we have Jesus. And what happened right before this takes place, he just cursed the fig tree for not having any fruit. And the disciples, they were amazed to see how quickly after he cursed the fig tree that it withered. And Jesus, Jesus, he begins to teach them that if they had faith, and if they didn't doubt that they too could do things like this and much more. See, Jesus was always using stories and parables to teach and explain things. So he uses the illustration, the example of a mountain. How it would seem impossible to move a mountain into the sea. But that it is possible if we believe it and not doubt it. I can't help but thinking of the mountains, how beautiful they look right up here. You know, we have this beautiful window in my kitchen. And when I'm washing dishes, that's my joy that I have in washing my dishes as I get to see this big, beautiful mountain. And as I was getting ready to, you know, get my title for my message together, 
I was looking for some pictures of some mountains, and I came across some pictures, okay? And I wanted them to use it, and it was actually Arnell, and she was looking out. We were on, what, ha what it is, is I used to, and I'm going to get back to it, I used to like going to the mountains, our mountains over here. I don't care, you could call them hills and valleys, but to me, they're a mountain. And Sonia and I in the women's home, we've gone up there a few times, some of the other women. And in this particular picture, it was Sonia, me, and some of the girls in the women's home. And there was a picture of Ashley as she's climbing up that little mountain. And I had a picture of her. And then there's a picture of Arnell. And she's like this. She's, she's standing on top of the mountain. And she's looking because we got to the top of the mountain. And I don't know about you, but for me, something about when you accomplish something big and great, it feels good. I don't know. It does something inside me. And that day, it did something inside us in the women's home because we climbed that mountain. That mountain wasn't easy. That hill, that valley, whatever you want to call it. Right, Sonia? It was a mountain to us. And we climbed it. We made it to the top. We pushed ourselves. We challenged ourselves. And I think about, you know, this story, and I think about that mountain. I think about how in Matthew 17, you can write this down, it says in 14 through 20, it opens up where there's actually, it actually opens up when you read it, it, it opens up at the they're at the foot of a mountain, and there's a large crowd, and there's a man. He knelt down before Jesus. So picture this. They're at the foot of a mountain. There's this big crowd there, and then there's Jesus. And this man, he kneels right there, and he begins to tell Jesus about his son, his son who suffered terribly from seizures, and he would fall into the fire into the, and into the water, and he's telling Jesus all this. And so to me, it gives me the description of a father who's desperate, a father who's desperate for a healing, for a miracle for his son. And so then what happens there in verse 16, he tells Jesus, he says, I, bought, I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him, Jesus. And Jesus said to them, to the disciples, he says, you, this is Jesus, okay, he was, he was, he was straightforward. He says, he, he says to the disciples, he says, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? He says, bring the boy to me. Okay, he says, bring the boy to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon because it was a demon in that boy and it left him. And the Bible says from that moment, the boy was made wow. See, afterwards, when everyone was already gone, the disciples wanted to know why they couldn't cast out that demon. They were like, why? Why couldn't we cast that demon out, Jesus? And so are you, able, are you picturing this with me? Because when I was reading this, I'm like picturing everything, you know. And Jesus tells them in Matthew 17, 20, he says, you don't have enough faith. He says, I tell you the truth. If you had faith. Even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain to move from here to there, and it would move. He says nothing would be impossible. When we were in Europe, I kept hearing about the mustard seed. And I learned a little bit about the mustard seed. They are one of the smallest of all seeds. It's one millimeter I was like, what is one millimeter? I had to Google it and look at a picture. <laughs> and actually, if you have a pen, who has a pen or a pencil in front of you? Look at the tip of your pen or pencil. That's a millimeter. That's one millimeter. And that's how big a mustard seed is. But when it grows, it can take over a field and grow into being 30 feet tall. Isn't that powerful? So similar to our faith, even if it's small, it can do incredible things if we have faith and believe. Amen? See, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, 
you and I can say to those mountains, do you have any mountains? Do you have any mountains that are in your way? Any mountains that you feel that just don't go away? Well, according to what my word says, that we're able to say to those mountains, we're able to speak into those mountains and command it to move and it shall be moved. Amen. See, there's nothing you and I cannot overcome through Christ. See, the devil lies to us and he makes us believe in our thinking and our thoughts and our traditional religious ways because we've been serving God for so many years and that thing hasn't changed and we begin to believe the lies of the enemy. We begin to believe that mountain will always be there. That mountain is never going to go away. And I got to tell you, I have been there many, many, many times. And I got to a place, I got tired of that mountain telling me what my God can do or not do. Amen? See, this is good news. This is good news for us. All we need is a tiny bit of faith. I read this somewhere, and it says it's the quality of the faith, not the quantity of our faith that moves mountains. There's a story in the Bible, and you can turn there. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's in Mark 12, 41 through 44. And it's a familiar scripture. I know many of us think of it when it comes to tithes and offering. And it's about the poor widow with the two mites. How many of you heard that story? The poor widow with the two mites. And the Bible talks about how she gave all she had. She gave it all. She compared to the rich people who gave large amounts of what they had. See, in this story, what's powerful about it is that Jesus sat near the collection box in the temple and he watched the crowds. He watched the crowds and they were giving and he's seen rich people give large amounts, but then he's seen this poor widow and she gave all she had to live on. Not just all she had, but all she had to live on, okay? So then when I thought about this, when you think about a mite, this is just, it's kind of cool to know these things, but a mite was like two coins that equaled a penny. So it was practically nothing. That was nothing. So this woman got Jesus' attention. Isn't that powerful? Her faith, it was her faith, it was her heart that got the attention of Jesus because it wasn't the amount of money, but it, it was it was because it was her all. It was the heart. It was the condition of her heart. It was, God, I trust you with it all. With it all. See, the rich gave only a little. That wasn't their all. Anybody could do that. So then it goes on to say, it, you know, it goes on to say about her. And I can't help when I was reading it. I was going through my notes. And you know what's crazy about it? Ask me what? The Bible says she was a woman, she was poor, and she was a widow. Do you know what that means? This woman had every excuse. This woman had the disadvantages. In those days, to be a woman, to be poor, and to be a widow, Ask your neighbor, what is your excuse? That's heavy, right? Like, I, I was blown away when God showed me that. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? That God can remove those mountains. See, those mountains, God didn't put them there. Maybe he's allowed them in our lives for a season to be there. But I believe sometimes mountains are there in our lives to do something in us and through us. I was listening to a message today that somebody messaged me on Instagram, and it was good. 
Tell your neighbor, it was good. <laughs> it was good. I'm not going to lie. And, and it was, I, I want to read it so I don't get it wrong, right? But it was so good because I was thinking about the mountains. And I thought about, man, sometimes we think mountains are there to kill us, to destroy us. Like, God, why did you do this to me? We feel like sometimes they're a curse from God. We feel like if I was like them or that person or this sister or that brother, then I could do that. But they got their own mountains. They got their own problems. They got their own challenges. See, and the difference is we're not different than, you know, when you think of somebody that Apostle Paul. When I think of Pastor Sonny, I think of great men and women of faith, and I think of their lives. I think, man, we serve the same God. My God is the same for them. He's the same for me, but yet they choose to believe different. And as I was listening to this message, I, I thought about it because we think those mountains are there to destroy us. But maybe that mountain, maybe that Goliath is there to take us to our next level. Maybe that mountain, that Goliath is, is there so that we could see the wonders of God. The mightiness of God. Amen? And I loved what he said. I'm going to get right into it. He says, in front of every major move of God, there will always be some storm, some kind of challenge, some kind of test, some kind of something. He says, David needed Goliath in his life. Before Goliath, David was just a shepherd boy. Goliath separated David from all the other shepherd boys. Goliath wasn't there to kill him, but he was there to introduce him. Otherwise, the king would have paid no attention to David if it had not been for that Goliath, amen. And, you know, God spoke to me. God spoke to me at this retreat when we were there in Europe. And he, like I said, he spoke to me about the mustard seed. And one of the pastor's wives there, she was talking about the mustard seed. And she, she began to, to just share about it. And one of the things that she said, she says, she said that mountain, she says, grew as big as it could. But that mustard seed of faith has much more room to grow. And she says, command those mountains and those giants to move out of your way. When you and I look at those mountains, they're not going to get any bigger. They're not going to grow they're not going to change and become extra on the side. They're going to stay the way they are. But when we have that mustard seed of faith, when we have that little tiny ounce of faith, our faith, that tiny mustard seed of faith is able to outgrow any mountain, any giant, any situation that is before us, amen. See, in Hebrews 11, 1, it says faith is this is what faith is. Now, faith is confidence of what we hope for and assurance of what we don't see. If we don't believe it, then we're probably not going to receive it. If you don't believe it, you're probably not going to receive it. You and I have to start letting God's word renew our minds. We got to stop letting our situations, our conditions, our disadvantages always dictate our faith. You know, it's, it's, it's like that's the part of us becoming religious people. I'll be honest. We become so religious, so stuck in tradition that we think we got it, God figured out. We think we always know better. We think because we've been in church a year, five years, 20 years, that you know what? This is all that God is going to do, that this is it for me. I've arrived. I get amazed when people think that they've already arrived. They don't say it. But sometimes they say it without saying it. And I think, man, even if I did all that I could in my ministry, there's so much more room that I could do for God. Because that's the God that we serve, amen. And everything that we do, it's by faith. I don't know who's told you different, but a lot of times, many people of faith have to do things afraid. It's not always comfortable. 
It's not always going to be where it's safe. It's going to be convenient. It's going to be the perfect timing, the perfect situation. But it's many times it's stepping out and doing it by faith. Stepping out and speaking it, even if you've already said it over and over again. But this time in faith, with that mustard seed of faith, commanding those mountains to move, amen. And I believe tonight that God wants to do something. God is good, amen. It was, it's all by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. And I'm going to share some faith killers with you right now. I was trying to think of another cool name, you know, like my husband says, um, what did you say? Fake Busters. I think there's a show called Busters or something. And I was thinking, I even asked my son, my son, I included him in helping me with my message because he, he's just, he's very smart. But I'm going to talk about some faith killers real quick. Okay, one of the faith killers is unbelief. Unbelief was the reason why the Israelites were excluded from the promised land. And Hebrews 3, chapter 3, 7 through 19, God's people heard his voice, but they were stubborn and they rebelled against God because of their unbelief. And because of, the, and because of that, their hearts became hardened because of unbelief, okay? And what happened is, in verse 19, it says, they never entered the promised land because they did not have faith. And a little, a few up, I kind of went back up. In 15, it says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. See, what happens is when we, we begin to get a, hard, a hardened heart, when we begin to not respond and obey the voice of God. Amen? A hardened heart is as useless as a hardened lump of clay. I thought about my kids as Play-Doh because we get Play-Doh around the house. We get all these crazy things. And every once in a while, we'll have Play-Doh on the table and it's hard as a rock. What do I do with that Play-Doh? What do my kids do with that Play-Doh? They don't do anything with it because it's useless. It's not moldable. It's not shapeable. So what we do is we trash it. And that's the example of what happens when our hearts begin to be hardened. We become stiff-necked. We begin to be, re it's, it's rebellion against God because if God is speaking, he's speaking, he's speaking, he's knocking at the door of our hearts and we keep ignoring the voice of God, guess what's going to happen? Sooner or later, you're not going to feel it no more. Sooner or later, sooner or later you'll, you'll be here in an altar call in church. You're not going to be moved no more. You'll go to conference. You'll go to a retreat. And you'll just be there because you're hard. Your heart's gotten hard, cold to the things of God, to the word of God. So that mustard seed faith, it just sits there. And eventually it dies there. That's powerful. Because this is what God was speaking to me. And that's what happens when we resist the will of God and we keep ignoring his voice. We become like the children of Israel. But what, what happens is it doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. Tell your neighbor, it doesn't just happen. Because what happens is it's a series of choices to disregard the voice of God, the will of God for our lives. Amen. Amen. So today, if you hear his voice, the Bible says, don't harden your hearts as the children of Israel did. Number two, faith killer is a religious spirit. Matthew 23 through 27, or 23, 27, you can turn there. It says, you Pharisees and teachers are in, trouble, in for trouble. You're nothing but show-offs. You're like tombs that have been whitewashed. On the outside, they are beautiful, but on the inside are full of bones and filth. See, the Pharisees of Jesus' days, they were like whitewashed tombs. They had a polished performance. They kept the laws. They followed all the rules and regulations, but they, were, they had a judgmental attitude towards others. They didn't walk in love. They didn't show any mercy. They appeared beautiful on the outward, but they were inside. They were full of dead men's bones. 
The term whitewashed tomb literally means a tomb that has been painted with whitewashed paint. If you have ever been to an old cemetery, you'll see those big old, you know, where it has somebody's name when they, right, those tombs. You guys know what I'm talking about? When we went to Israel, they have these massive, big ones, big, 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 huge ones. Well, what it is when it says a whitewashed tomb, all they would do is paint it with a whitewash paint. And, but under that tomb, what's in there? Dead. Dead. Dead people. There's no life in there. And what happens is we become religious and traditional. We're dead. So we look good on the outside. We carry our Bible. We come to service. We know all the yes, amens. We know when to stand, to sit. We know Sunday service, Wednesday service, but we're dead inside. We do what we do because of traditions, because of laws, or because I don't want to hear my leader or the pastor tell me. But we're not moved because God is there. We're not moved because, you know what, I get to give and pour into these kids every single week. I get to be able to do that life group and impart life into people. I'm, I'm, you know, and that's what happens. We, we forget the whys. We begin to get caught up in the do's, the don'ts, and all those things. But it goes back to the heart, amen. And that's the religious spirit. See, there's, I mean, I'm going to go through this part because this is, I really wanted to drive this home. See, there was two types of religious groups of people. One was the Pharisee, and the Pharisees were primarily moved, motivated by performance mentality. They believed God would be pleased with them if they performed up to a certain standard. But a modern Pharisee, their mentality is that they believe that God would, be, would bless them and be pleased with them and accept them and only unless they perform a certain standard that motivates. And I thought about, like, how that could happen. Like, okay, God, like, we get caught up in the doings, right? And there's nothing wrong with the doings. But then we're, that's it. It's just the doing. I did my job, and it becomes like, okay, God, you're pleased with me. You know, have you ever met those type of people? I, I, I gave God my time. I did, you know, my, my Holy Communion, my baptism and all that stuff. Or I, I went to church on Christmas. I did my time with God. I had my alone. But it, it becomes a, like a, okay, God's pleased with me. And I'm not trying to say that in a bad way, but I was Catholic before. And there's some great Catholics that have a strong faith, but I wasn't like that. I, it was a traditional thing. So I hope, like, you're understanding what I'm sharing on this part. Then the other religious group were the Sadducees. So, how do you say it? So, Sadducees. They were rationalists of their time. They didn't believe in the power of God or the supernatural. They were the ones that explained away the miraculous, and they relied on human reasoning and human wisdom. They were driven by belief that human knowledge and intellect were a means to ends. See, the Pharisees believed performance was the way to please God. In other words, if I do this, this is what's going to happen. And the other religious group believed human reasoning and human wisdom, that alone was going to be the way to understand God. In other words, it's only if this happens, then this is going to happen. We become so rationalized. We try to, like, kind of calculate everything. If I do this, then this is going to happen. Both of these religious groups put Jesus in a box, amen. It was almost impossible for them to even try to believe God for the miraculous, the absolute, supernatural, the mir miracles and wonders of God. And Paul had to deal with these areas in both of these in the early church. And you can read that on your own time, but you can find it in Galatians 3. And Paul, he started to, he, he dealt with it. it. It talks about the law of faith. And Paul asked them directly in Galatians 3, he says, in chapter 3, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? He says, of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be after starting the new lives in the Spirit? Why are you now, now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? And see, like, that's how we could be. Like, we, we, when God is telling us, and he's telling us to step out, and he's telling us to trust him. 
And he's telling us to do this. I know you're not used to doing this. But if you do this, I'm going to move. And then we get so stuck and trying to figure everything out. But when we started our race, we started it in the spirit. When we came to Christ, it wasn't because of what we did for Christ. It wasn't because of all the time that we gave to Christ. We accepted Christ. We had the faith to believe that God was real, that he died on the, on the cross for my sins. And now I'm alive in Christ. I was once dead, but now I'm alive. And we got to that place of salvation because of faith, because we believed. And then we get to a place now where God is trying to break all those religious thoughts and ways and and, and mindsets and thinkings that we have. And he can't get in. He can't penetrate because there's a box all around us. And he's telling us to step out. He's saying in this season, step out. He's saying, trust me. Do what you normally wouldn't do and see if I will not be there. See if I will not show up for you. You give your your tithes in these 90 days and you'll be faithful and see what what I will do. And for those who have been faithful with their tithes, like me, God has been telling me, give your 20%. Forget the 10%. Get out of that religious box. Get out of the religion and the tradition. And God is saying for me to step out, to go above the tithe. And I can tell you that in I in this season of doing that, I've been seeing God working miracles. I've been seeing the wonders of God. But it's not going to happen if you just stay where you're at. If you stay in the shallow, you're never going to know what's in the deep. If you stay stuck in those ways of thinking, that's all you're going to believe. You're never going to believe or think anything different for your life. You're going to think that's how it's always going to be. He's never going to change. My kids will never come to Christ. This situation, this problem, this condition that I have will never change. And we become like those those. Those whitewashed tombs were just dead inside, amen? And my last point, the last killer, actually there's two. Another faith killer is baggage. I'm not going to get into it, but it's baggage. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about getting rid of everything that holds your faith down. And I can't help but to think of the baggage that we carry sometimes. We went to Europe, and Sonia had the biggest baggage, and that baggage held her down. She was trying to climb up the stairs. She was trying to take it on the train and on that plane. And everywhere she went, there's Sonia with her big old baggage. And not only that, somebody had to come alongside of her and begin to help her to pick up her baggage. And some of us are like that. We're laughing, but we got baggage. And God is saying that we got to get rid of that baggage. There are some people that are baggage in our lives. There are hindrances in our lives. There's a mentality. We have these mentalities that are stuck in their baggage. We got excuses. We're always having, we're the best at all the excuses. Why we can't do this. Why we can't be there. Why that can't happen. Why, 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 why baggage. The woman, the poor widow woman had excuse she had she had a good excuse she didn't even use that amen not only that i thought about this one laziness ask me why because you know what sometimes we think it's just going to happen we don't want to go after it we don't want to go after it we don't want to go to the the multi-regional we don't want to go to november fire we want to stay stuck home in our pjs Not everybody, but there are some. We don't want to go the extra mile and read in our word every day. We don't want to pray every day. We don't want to fast and deny that meal for a day. But we are saying, oh, I'm so tired of that mountain. Oh, that mountain's so big. Oh, that problem. Oh, that person's never changing. But I don't want to do my part That's baggage. Those are excuses. That's laziness. If you want it, you got to go after it. You got to be desperate for it. Remember with the pool of Bethsaida, I love that, that story. And there was a pool and there was a move of God. 
And, and the, that crippled person could have just made excuses, but he found a way. He found a way to get that breakthrough. He found a way to get that miracle. See, we, we know how to find a ways for the things that we want. But what about for the things that God wants for us, amen? And my last one is the faith killer of a bad recept a perception of who God is. Perception is the ability to hear or become aware of something through senses. It's the quality of being aware of things through, phys through the physical, and I'm adding this, through the spiritual senses. Every person perceives the world and approaches life problems differently. The way we see can make all the difference for the good or for the bad. Hebrews 12, 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. When we focus our attention on Jesus, when we keep our eyes on Jesus, we're able to see God. We're able to see not those mountains. We're able to see that God is able. We're able to know that through what we've gone through, and as, you, as the worship team comes up, and as you stand, What happens is when you and I, like we all have our, our I don't want to say just stories, but we all have reference points of how God met us. We all have reference points that those moments, those seasons, that one day when I could have, but I didn't. We all have stories like my husband when he was driving and how that car hit him. And he flipped over two times. But how God protected him. God kept him alive. We all have that story. When we were at our very last. And how God, because of God being who God is. And that mustard seed of faith. That we said, God, God, this is all I have. But I give it to you, God. And we sing God. Have you not seen God? I know all of you have seen God. Do the miraculous. You've seen God part Red Seas in your life. You've seen God heal people. You've seen God use you in ways that blew you away. See, and that's, it's not just faith alone, but it's in how we see God. I can't help but think of, of Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie. They're always taking steps of faith. Because they know their God. And they know what their God is able to do. They don't have a mentality, that grasshopper mentality. They don't have a mentality that God is enabled. They've seen God. And when I'm around those faith giants, something steers me up. Being there in Europe, being around these people that are taking nations, that are taking countries, cities, Something about when I'm around people like that just does something in my spirit. When I'm around mountain-moving people. See, that's why you got to get rid of baggage. Those people you're around, those negative people, the complainers, the, all, the doubters. There's always going to be those. There's always going to be those that say why this can't happen and why that can't change. The Bible says in Daniel 11:32. The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Psalms 910, those who know your name trust in you. Don't let nothing, don't let those mountains intimidate you. Don't let them put fear in you. Don't let them paralyze you. Knowing about faith and having faith are two different things. Courage is not the absence of fear, but it's the triumph over fear. That's what courage is. As you're right there, I want you to lift up your hands. They're going to sing that song. I want you to think about those giants, those mountains, those circumstances, those problems, those burdens that have been weighing you down. Those lies down. that the enemy has been speaking. 
to you at night when you wake up in the morning and all you do is see that mountain think about that mountain see tonight it's going to take people that are going to choose tonight to step out to believe God for the impossible Jesus said that if we say to that mountain to move from here to there that it shall be done see it's not putting trust in yourself but it's putting a trust and a reliance in the king of kings and the lord of lords it's saying god you are able i command those mountains right now in the name of jesus to be lifted up and thrown into the sea they are not going to be in my way anymore see it's going to take people like that widow she gave it all she stepped out and if you feel that in any way this message is ministered to you these altars are open but don't come if you don't mean it don't come don't come, don't come. I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but don't come if you're gonna just be up here daydreaming. Don't come up here if you're going to be in another place. But I want people of faith to come to these altars and let's believe God together tonight. The mountains are coming down tonight. We are going to believe. God is you going want to do to. the supernatural at do these altars you that you and I are not walking now out the same in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. To do whatever you want to.